Welcome to the Mom Manual. Motherhood doesn't come with instructions, but it should. We are on a mission to highlight ordinary moms doing extraordinary things to build the ultimate mom manual. Every week, I have the distinct honor of speaking with women about the lessons they've learned and the inspiration that got them to where they are today. Join us for a conversation that will spark creativity, provide actionable tips, and celebrate the ordinary and extraordinary moments of motherhood. The Mom Manual starts now. Hello everyone, Tara Williams here with the Mom Manual. I have another amazing guest for you all today. Dr. Diana Dixon is a doctor of public administration. She's a certified lactation counselor and a breastfeeding specialist, and she is founder of Pump With Purpose. Diana, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for having me. <laughs> Thank you for being here. I am so excited to hear about your journey. Can you tell everybody from the time you got certified up to founding your business, what, yeah. what led you to all that? So I want to help. Um, my motto is to normalize pumping and let the world know we pump with purpose. So I started my breastfeeding journey. I wanted to nurse really, really badly, like a lot of people and the societal pressures. Both of my children were tongue tied and lip tied, and I wasn't able to successfully do so. So I just had to figure it all out on my own. And so I had two amazing successful journeys and then I was getting ready to wean. My first journey was nine months and I wanted to have another baby. So I saved 3000 ounces for the freezer just so I can be able to provide in breast milk for the year. Then on my second journey, I felt so much guilt. So I was like, well, I'm not going to end. And I pumped over three years for both of my wow. children. I gave the toddler, gave the infant what the infant needed. And then my um, I sold, saved a bag a day of frozen breast milk just to have for in case of emergency. And I gave my toddler any of my oversupply. Um, so I'm very proud of both of my journeys. Um, at around two years and some change, I kind of got sad and I was the thought of weaning was like my goal was like two years and I just didn't know what to do. And so everyone's like, you should write a book because everyone knows like they were pumping. They were talking to me like even yeah. before pumping. Yeah. And so they were like, oh, you should write a book. But I talk better than I write. I don't like to write at all. Like I'm a talker. And yeah. so so I'm sitting on my couch. I never forget it. And I was like, I'm just going to start a business. And then I thought of names and all the things. And I was just so sad about my weaning journey. And I'm like, well, if I can have a third baby through my business and lactation private practice, then I can help the world pump my purpose as well. So it all kind of like birthed with the name and I didn't get it sad anymore. So I started the business and I then was like, let me get certified because I just know all the things about pumping. So I obtained my certified lactation counselor, um, certified breastfeeding specialist. I was already a doctor of public administration that was from helping underserved communities in my corporate career, um, really helping underserved communities be able to get the information that they need. And pumping, in my opinion, is an underserved, underrepresented community. So it kind of just all worked together, all of the yeah. certification degrees. So I started Pump With Purpose. I am so proud of everything that I've done, being able to help the pumping community. I see about 100 to 200 clients each and every month, all focused in pumping. Um, last year, when I saw all, over 1,400 people and just helping to normalize pumping. We don't get pumping care. We don't get pumping help um, when it comes to pumping. If something is going on at birth and we can't, um, nursing is not going well, where do people have resources that actually focus on pumping? Not just, here's a pump. Here's some flanges. Uh, good luck. That's what yeah. usually happens. I create a safe space in place for people to do what works best for them on their infant feeding journey. It doesn't matter if it's nursing, pumping, formula feeding. I help you to fit pumping in any of that, either exclusive pumping or occasional pumping and any pumping to your nursing or formula feeding journey. Oh my gosh. Wow. Okay. Well, first off, amazing. Congratulations Thank on the, the success of the business. hundred to 200 people per month. That's just, you're it's touching. Global. I forgot to mention global lactation private practice. I've seen clients on every single continent except Antarctica. Oh my gosh. I love that. That is so awesome. Okay. Yeah. So going back to yeah. your journey, what, yeah. what made you want to pump for two to three years? you know, at like one year was my goal, which I did not make. I wanted to breastfeed for one year. That was my idea. But also I did do pumping too because I traveled a lot for work. So it was really just getting them the breast milk for the year. Cause I thought there were health benefits, but beyond the first year are like, what, what was the concept behind two to three years? Cause there's so many benefits. Like just because the clock strikes one doesn't mean we have to be done with our journey, especially if children are, you know, 
done with nursing or they're not nursing as much to actually keep the breast milk sustained and milk supply up, pumping is a way to protect supply. My biggest reason, there's a lot of reasons for health benefits. And I felt bad that my first son didn't get fresh breast milk for over a year. The immunity antibody benefits, I've gotten my breast milk tested at age two, three, and um, two, two and a half and three. And the benefits, fat, protein is almost off the charts. Um, my breast milk at three, age three, when I got it tested again, was at 36 calories and formula is 20. Um, so it just continues to get more and more beneficial as time goes on. Immunity benefits, COVID happened. Um, and so I was like, we weathered a lot of storms with that as well. But my biggest, can I tell you, my biggest secret benefit was to prove to the world. So many people at the beginning told me I wasn't going to be successful at pumping. I wasn't going to be able to pump long term. It wasn't going to be sustainable. It wasn't going to be a long term solution. And I've helped the world sh to show the world that pumping is long term. I mean, it's a viable, sustainable solution. It can go as long as you want. Our breast milk actually does last. Um, so just to show people, um, people that look like me, people that look to me for yeah. pumping, people never see people pump that long. I pump eh, longer than people nurse and or pumped. So right. just to show that you don't have to be done. There are ways to make it easier as well. Right. Because I think for a lot of women, especially those who work, saying that you're going to breastfeed your child up to age three, it, it feels so daunting and unrealistic that it's just not, I, I think people wouldn't even conceive that they could do it. But pumping, you know, you can do it on the go, you can do it in your car, you can freeze it, store it, save it. I think that that sounds more manageable. So for anyone listening, I'd be thinking, you know, at the child's second birthday, like, what are you pumping 10 times a day? Like, what does that look like for you? <laughs> I created an oversupply for myself. So I'm a big proponent of oversupply, full supply, yes. free bash, all of those things. So I was able to drop down pumps. So around a year, I was at four times a day, which is much I aligned it with my children's naps. So from there until at least 24 to 30 months, I was at four times a day. Then I dropped to three when my youngest dropped the second nap. So he went from two to one. So I aligned it from four times a day, all aligned with my youngest sleep schedule. So when I was pumping, they were asleep. My oldest is not, they're 18 months apart, but it wasn't as bad. Like, you know, if he happened to be up, but once he dropped the, to one nap, then I pumped three times a day, all while they were sleeping and it's morning, midday and night. And it was feasible. And I love it. I loved pumping. I mean, it's my, I'm type A, so I need to see what baby's getting, what I'm producing. So pumping was the best thing that ever happened to me that I didn't realize it until the time. And people actually realize that it doesn't have to be as hard as we make it out to be. Once we get a system of playing in the right tools, it's just absolutely amazing. Yeah. I want to circle back to that. But one thing I'm thinking is I know for me, I felt like my body was not my own while, and I, my birthing and breastfeeding journey, my first three, well, my first two kids are 14 months apart. And then my second and third is 18 or 17 months apart. And then my third and fourth is three years apart. So I, my first three, I had in two and a half years and I felt like I was pregnant or nursing for like literally four years in a row. And it was, it just felt completely overwhelming. And then before I had my fourth, I needed a little bit of a break, but what did that feel like? It sounds like you really enjoyed it. Um, did you feel like you were, you know, in, in a way like, a making the milk, right. Versus like enjoying, I, I know some people really enjoyed the, um, the act of bonding with the child while actually breastfeeding. So did it feel more like a job to you? Did you feel like you had your body? Like, talk to me about that aspect. So as far as starting out in the grand scheme of life, pumping is only a small time of that, if that makes sense. Right. So since pumping is a small time of that, then it didn't, it doesn't, in the grand scheme of things, three years doesn't feel like that long. Yes, um, I was a size two beforehand and I'm not being a size two since then. Um, right. But pumping is, to me, was just a small feat. Plus, I looked at it as sustaining human life for my children. Um, so I didn't look at it as a job. I didn't look at it. I looked at it like it is the only tailored thing that a child is ever going to have that's perfectly tailored for them. Mm, yeah. And if I look at it like that and I'm providing hundred percent of their nutrients from my body for up to a year. I mean, we did introduce solids at six months and we also did introduce alternative milk at 18 months. But again, it was all from me and I'm sustaining their life and nothing else they're ever going to get in life that's perfectly for them. And so 
taking yeah. three years out of their 18 year life to pump was a small feat for me, like yeah. just small. So you really went into it with the right mental attitude. Yes. Well, because think about it like this. When for me, I didn't feel like I I was able to nurse due to every child is not able to be born nursing. So nothing feels vindicated as to providing a whole like fuller bottles, breast milk. That's a nice consolation prize, right? Of I'm still providing breast milk to my child because the world makes us think that if we don't um, nurse, then we're not breastfeeding or we're not going to be successful. So, but I am, and I'm lasting longer than people nurse and or pump, if that makes sense. No, this makes total sense. And I, I actually love the concept and we, and, and let's jump into this of that overflow. So with my first three babies really close, my daughter was two and a half. My other daughter was 17 months when my third was born. And so it was just chaos. I didn't have that same amount of time as I did with my first to just like sit and nurse and, you know, sleep while they're sleeping. It's like, I have these two other babies at home. And so I started pumping right away with my third and I would feed him bottles on the go. And then I noticed at probably about three months, he no longer wanted to latch to me. And I think it was because he was more, it was more work for him to latch to me versus (laughs) just drinking a bottle. Right. Okay. And the bottle, the hole in the bottle can be bigger or smaller. And so it was just, it was just easier for him. And I remember thinking, um, let's see, he's born in February and it was, it was in July where I remember I didn't have a bottle with me. Um, We were on vacation. I think I forgot my pump or it died or something. And I tried to give him to, to myself. And it was like, he wouldn't, he wouldn't take it. He wouldn't attach. And I was like, Oh my gosh. And I remember feeling really sad and a little bit panicked. So I was like, I didn't realize I thought he would just take either. Um, but that ended up being such an amazing solution for me because I was able to continue giving him breast milk for nine months. And I would not, I definitely wouldn't have been able to do that if I was trying to stop every time and feed him. And I did what you said, like at the beginning, I pumped a ton extra and we froze it. So then he was able to actually be fed through almost a year, which I too, like felt very proud of. I can't imagine three years like that is so amazing, but it just, I agree. Like I felt like I was giving him the best start, the best benefit. And like you said, that perfectly tailored solution. So what is your advice for women who, um, you know, when we first get home from the hospital, we have a ton of extra milk and it's, it's really up to our body to regulate what the baby needs. So is that the time to start that overflow pumping or like, what's the best advice for that? So it depends on the person and that's where lactation care becomes personalized, Mm -hmm. where and may not want as much oversupply. My highest clients make 120 ounces a day um, and they're feeding other children. They're feeding their, everyone in their journey has a right to do and determine what they want to do with their body. So if someone doesn't want as much oversupply, then you wouldn't pump like that. If yeah. someone, you do. And that is where I want to get the world away from like really helping women figure out when they pull up here mm-hmm. and then what do you want for your journey? They don't even know. Like they have no idea what the, so options, they, yeah. what the options are, what they can do, what they can't do, or they just want to just figure out, they think they want what the social media platform show with all these women, with all this milk and pouring it everywhere, not realizing that you work yourself on that type of oversupply. Oh no, you're not going to be able to have a life as much because you're going to be at the pump a lot. So right. you really... All of, you know, I don't, I've made 50 to 55 ounces on my second journey, never had mastitis, had a clogged duck if I slept a lot, but you got to learn how to empty out the breath. So people have to really realize do they really want the oversupply that they're asking for and helping them to help manage it if they do get the oversupply because the world wants to scare people that the moment they make a little bit more that they can do what you did and just put away a bag or two a day, that is not causing a mess. And people just think that like, oh, well, if I get more milk that I'm of an overactive letdown, people can have overactive letdown even if they don't even make enough milk. It's just how fast the milk lets down. So it's just a lot of issues and like untold truths Mm -hmm. that myths that people are believing and it jades their journey that they don't get to end three years and happy and actually sad about it that my frozen stash lasted three years. It lasted with my children because I was able to rotate it through. I just made sure that it lasted. So I used my last bit of frozen milk in October. I have the video. I can't even post it because it makes me sad. Um, Just to think about that. My frozen stash is like, I have a little one still, but not like the big, the bigger one that had the five ounce bags. So when I think of the oversupply, 
I, <laughs> I think there's kind of two ways to do it, right? So there's at the beginning, you just pump a bunch and then it kind of levels out or you always do like one extra pump a day. Is that kind of the two concepts of getting an oversupply? It, it just depends. It, it literally, I mean, yes, the more you pump, the potentially the more you make. There's a, other things like underlying conditions that could be present just depending on like what is going on. Something could be preventing that. Something could have happened at birth. You hemorrhage. You have retained placenta. There's so many women that have their journeys robbed from them by their birth trauma experience. So just making sure that people understand that it can look like what depends on how your birth happens and making sure that everything is done well it depends on how soon you want to add the pump to your journey how often you want to pump all of those things yes of course the more you pump potentially the more milk you make and it just depends on but you can't control that so people are like oh i only want to make three ounces extra uh, no okay, okay. You can't pick the number and think that like oh, i'm gonna do this you either gonna you don't know and that's what i help people uh, see, I, yeah, I thought you could be like, all right, I'm just gonna have like an extra four ounces each day. Oh, so that's one bottle. Oh, see, that's me, me being naive. Um, and talk to us about the phalange, because I know that is something nobody tells you about. They're just like, here it is. Go. What do, what do we need to know about that? So you need to be appropriately flange sized by someone that understands flange sizing. There's the flange size and there's flange type. Breast pump sizing for flanges is an art and a science. The art is that your nipples are going to be a certain size. The art part is, is what actually works best for you. Some people, their nipples are elastic where the nipples stretch and swell to the back of the flange or swell up. So it depends like what they need for themselves. They're different products, silicone, hard plastic, what actually works best for the person. People just go out here and throw flange product after flange product after flange product and not realizing like, making sure you are understanding what your nipples are doing in the flanges and what you're looking at and what you're looking for really does have an impact on how successful you're going to get milk out of your breast. People are sized inappropriately from the beginning. Like people look at the size of the areola or like, oh, you need to be, or culturally, like they're different people that their areolas may be bigger. So people think they need these huge sizes. So they end up, I've had to size people from a 36 down to an 18 because they've been pumping incorrectly and literally a lot of concerns, swelling, inflammation, mm -hmm. a lot of concerns because they're not appropriately sized well. And people trust that when they're, they are sized on a social media platform or with a professional that they're, they're trusting that and it may not ever be what they should have done in the first place. And so, and sorry, you mentioned this a little bit, but if you have the wrong size, what is the issue? Oh my gosh, I can't even like, you know, <laughs> nipple pain, nipple trauma, nipple damage, nipple soreness. Your nipples could turn colors, purple, blue, white, sharp shooting pains throughout the breast or nipple sensitivity going from the warm air of your shower to the cool air of your bathroom. You could have intense clogs. You could get mastitis. You could go on and on and on. Um, it's wow. just, it's a lot of concerns if you're in the wrong flange size. Mm. And and I know with each pump, it usually gives about three, right? And no real guidance. I've never seen guidance inside the pumps on, on what they guidance. And even when they do now, people are telling me, oh, this brand made the, the sizing. If I'm this size, and most of that's wrong as well, because they don't Google and anyone else cannot help you unless they're looking at your nipples and seeing what's going on. You can't just say, oh, you're this size, so then you're going to be this. No, it's setting people up for failure. You really have to understand the elasticity, how it's moving in the flange, the appropriate movement. And mm -hmm. then you have to understand how the milk output is coming out of it. Oh. Somebody could get the right flange size and then their milk output drops the heck in a hand basket. Mm -hmm. Then that could be flange size or the pump. It could be the settings are wrong. It could be too high of a suction. People think higher suction equals more milk. And yes. that is. Yes. Yeah. I remember um, I, when I had my first daughter and I was traveling a lot for work, I was traveling to different hospitals. And so I would always go into the nursery ward and pump real quick in between. I was doing uh, surgeries and they always had this like amazing setup room with the, um, the hospital grade pump and it like the suction was so strong. And then I would go home and I try to turn mine all the way up to kind of match it. And I always thought, yes, if it's higher and it's going faster, you're getting more and that's better, man. I would have really, really benefited from having a lactation counselor. And, and, you know, for anyone who's listening and is like, geez, maybe I have the wrong flange. Maybe I don't really know what I'm doing. Like what, what does that look like to work with a lactation counselor and what should people look for when they're wanting to hire someone? 
So to me, I think that they need to really understand that the person actually specializes in pumping. So I'm going to draw the line in the thin of, I don't assist with nursing concerns. Like I don't assist with match, nipple shields, bottle preferences, like trying to get baby to go back and forth. Like those aren't my highest and best use. I'm only concerned with the person, the person that's pulling up. So when you work with me, you're going to get a plan that includes the right talking through the pump. If you have one, if you need to pick one, I have 60 pumps behind me. So all of this display is all pumps. I have another oh my gosh eight over there that I need to try out to continue you know just to figure out you know to, I do reviews on pumps so if you follow any of my wow. social media channels like YouTube those that's the easiest place to find of a bus breast pump review playlist. So any of the 60 pumps that I've tried so far I have a review out there that discusses the um the operation of the pump um how to assemble the parts and then like my initial thoughts of it because mm -hmm. some pumps it's not for me, so I can't just use it for a week or two because right. uh, it's not, like I know my body so well and what works for me. But when people work with me, I help them with their pump, flange, products, and schedule. It is what I call the pumping equation. So they have a premier pumping consult where people can book time for us to talk through those things where I help match them into products and don't just throw money after it. Pumping is a device driven, product driven space mm -hmm. that people want to say, try this, try this, try this without understanding what the person actually needs. Mm -hmm. Some people issues like nipple sensitivity, even before pumping, like they have highly sensitive nipples. So you can't go put them in the strongest pump on the market. People mm -hmm. just want to throw products at people, say, buy this, and it's going to sit there as a coaster. And they've wasted three, four, five, eight hundred. Some people have six pumps and like four of them work for them. Like they would have wow. been, they tell me things that like, lets me know what they like. That helps me to like throw out 40 pumps and then keep narrowing it down till we find one. And then we talk about, you know, do you want to be chained to the wall all the time, which is not my preference. People think that I want you to be chained. Nope. I usually don't suggest that, but depends on what they want, their budget, you know, budget is big with pumping. Like I have products that range from br pumping bras. I have over 30 pumping bras in here. They range from $20 to like $70. Right. You still have to realize there's a thing for everyone, but right. you just, Want people to go in a financial deficit trying to pump with trying to find all of these products and they most of them wouldn't work for them anyway that's such a, a great point um because my understanding now is that everyone gets a free pump through their insurance is if you have yeah. insurance is that right correct well, it, you know, some, it just depends, you know, some people, they need a prescription to get insurance. I mean, get a pump. Some people is only one pump in their lifetime. Some people is one pump per baby. My insurance was one pump a year, but then they limited. I can only get one pump. A, like it's all these nuances. Um, Some insurance companies offer products. It's, you don't ask for it. Sometimes they don't tell you where yeah. they send you. Just, they send you storage bags. Um, They send you extra pump parts. So just working with someone that helps you save some money and bypass all of the exploitation that can happen with like this buy everything notion or trying to replicate someone else's journey. I, I can't have your journey. You couldn't have my journey because all of our bodies are different. So like I want people, my clients, when they pull up, I help them create the confidence that when they pull up to the pump, they know what's best for them. Not the person that they're watching that's in this pump or this flange and they're trying to go use it. And they're not even getting any of the same success. Does that make sense? Yeah. And this is so interesting because I had my first daughter um, in 2012 and that was almost pre-Instagram, you know, Facebook was happening, but the social media. So when you're saying that this is something where people are buying multiple pumps, I, I, it's really surprising to me. Um, I think I had just looked up like, which is the strongest, best pump? It was like Medela. And so, you know, whatever the new one was at that time. And then I remember my... I think it was my OBGYN was like, Hey, do you know, like you can get a free pump with your insurance? And I was like, Oh no. And then that was a different one, a different brand. I can't remember which, and I actually ended up liking that better. And then because my kids were so close in age, one thing I was thinking of, and I was wondering, can I use the same pump for all three of them, for example, or does it like lose its efficacy after six months or a year? Um, can you pass it down? Can you share them? What do you think on that? So as far as I'm always about new pumps from the beginning, mm -hmm. um, if you want to use any prior pumps from your own journey, you, they could be a backup pump because pumps are like cars. You don't mm -hmm. leave your car for nine months and not use it. Right. Um, right. So you, you, in my opinion, you want to start it up every so often. If you're going to just keep the motor run, it's a device. Right. Um, I, 
like a new pump each and every journey where if you do want to use the old one, but pumps have a useful life. So if you're me and I'm pumping seven to eight times a day versus someone that pumps once or twice a day, yeah. the use of it is going to look different. Does that make so? Yeah, totally. it, I am, I'm a big fan of new pumps each and every journey, but budgets and all the other things, I'm not a big fan. I'll say it, not a fan of used pumps for plenty of reasons. You don't know how that person used the last pump. You right. don't know how air of it. You don't know what they did, how long it set, what, how, if they got water in the tubing, because people don't know you're not supposed to wash your tubing. Um, and then they can ruin the motor or get mold inside of the motor because it goes straight mm-hmm. into the fucking it back in. Um, you won't know. And yeah. you want to give the child the best benefit. Um, people can use use pumps. I don't, I'm all about informed decisions. So if you want to do something outside of that, please understand the risk of the practice as well. But if you want to do it, because I understand people do that, but at least they know. Um, yeah. And if people, not only new pumps having a concern, people have bought new pumps and when they get in, they're like, something's not right. Then they reach out to the manufacturer because you don't know how long it's been sitting on the shelf. It could be mm-hmm. sitting on the shelf for three years and they found it buried in a bag and they're like, oh, it's we found one here. No, yeah, not you. You get it and it's not operating appropriately. Or I've had people that have used pumps they bought for someone else and the pump is not working the moment that they get it. Or they had the pump sitting for seven years and then it was like, oh, I have this pump here. He, all of these things can happen with used pumps from someone right. else. At least right. if it's from your own journey, you know what you did and yeah. you know like new. So when something is not right, you are able to understand that it can impact your journey. Right. No, that makes total sense. I remember um, just seeing them a, a, a ton on like being in different mothers groups and those like kind of sale groups. And, you know, people are like, oh, I bought this one and they didn't like it. And but yeah, it, it, it was always kind of a weird thing to me because there's that, you know, element of the breast mm-hmm. milk. Now, <laughs> you so you had mentioned you have a bunch of different pumps. What do you think about the ones like the LV pump, the ones that sit on your breast? Like that seems amazing to me. Do they actually work? Depends on the person. So mm-hmm. um, use wearable pumps, but I don't. And I strongly believe I've said it on my platform that they should not be a primary pump. You mm-hmm. should not just try to establish your p- supply with those pumps. Hence, but I do have people making 60 plus ounces on a wearable pump only. So right. that is where the personalized part of it is. If you want to take the chance, because you don't know what your supply is going to be until it happens right. with it, fine. But if I just recommend adding it in for convenience. If I needed to be out and about, I pumped at fairs. I still enjoyed my life with a convenience pump, but I knew when I got to my car or got back to my house, I was going to pull up to a more traditional. Yeah. That's all. And those ones are actually more expensive than the stationary, right? Yeah. But it's even worse if it doesn't work for you. If that yeah. Makes yeah. Wow. I never even thought of that. Okay. And talk to us a little bit about schedules. I know everything is super personalized, but is there kind of some general best rules of practices on schedules? If I want to draw the line in the sand again, if someone is exclusive pumping or they're nursing and pumping. So let me start with exclusive pumping first. My 240 minute rule that I portray and talk about on my platform is if someone wants to pump from birth is every three hours for 30 minutes for the first 12 weeks with the right pump, flange, products, and schedule. The reason why is because I'm all about full supply. I found in what I see and what people tell me on my platform and what my clients tell me back is sometimes 15 minutes is not enough for some people to empty out efficiently doesn't mean that I don't meet and know people that pump for 15 minutes and make 60 ounces a day but for the people if they don't know until they try it it is every three hours for 30 minutes for the first 12 weeks that is to establish supply then after 12 weeks milk supply regulates and what that looks like is around 10 to 14 weeks on average 12 weeks you start feeling less engorged. It can be early depending on the person, all of those things. But on average, around 12 weeks, the breasts start to feel less engorged. Um, you start to get a consistent amount of milk. Because Of course, when you're pumping, you can see the amount of milk you get. So you get a consistent amount between zero to five ounces. And that starts to tell you I'm starting to regulate. So then after that, it becomes based on your milk output, your baby's intake, and then your goals. So for me, I wanted three years. Someone else that wants one year, they may not want to start dropping pumps as soon. If you, you know, want to be done by the first birthday versus me, third birthday, I was second was the original goal. You yeah. you may not drop in as fast. So you really want to take a, an account or let's say, for instance, you, your baby is taking in 30 ounces a day. If you are producing 
35, then you have an undersupply. You may not want to do so. If you're at 35 or more, then you may want to consider dropping extra pumps. So that is what is so important when you are pumping to understand that it's about your milk supply. Because when you start dropping pumps, you can either increase, decrease, or stay the same. You won't know until you do it. And if you're like me, that once I decrease, I could never get my milk supply back. Some people, they can play fast and loose with their milk supply. But like, oh, I don't really pump, I'm going to pump this time. Then I'm going to do this. And their milk supply can move and shake with them. Some people, they cannot. Today's episode was brought to you by Dreamland Baby. I want to introduce you to a product that hundreds of thousands of parents use to help their baby sleep. The Dreamland Baby Weighted Sleep Sack. Hi, I'm Tara Williams, host of the Mom Manual and founder of Dreamland Baby. When my son Luke was six months old, he was still waking up every hour and a half. I was completely exhausted, frustrated, and at my wit's end. Sound familiar? My solution to create a gently weighted sleep sack that babies can safely wear to help them feel calm, fall asleep faster, and stay asleep longer. The award-winning doctor-approved Dream Weighted Sleep Sack and Swaddle features our proprietary CoverCom technology, evenly distributed weight from your baby's shoulders to toes to help naturally reduce stress and allow your little one to feel relaxed and sleep soundly. If you're struggling to get your baby to sleep for longer stretches and go down easier, you're not alone. This product was a game changer for my son and can be for your family too. And right now we've got a special discount exclusive to mom manual listeners. Use code mom manual 15 at checkout to get 15% off site-wide. Isn't it time for you to invest in rest? For nursing and wanting to add pumping to your journey, it really depends on your baby. So when you are nursing, you don't want to just start adding pump. I tell my clients all the time, I protect your supply with pumping, especially if there's a concern with latch and you're trying to get baby back to breast. But if you genuinely want to create some type of oversupply, you don't want to pick random times to pump because then if you pump all your breast milk out, then you have no milk left for your baby. So you want to be strategic and understanding that's what by that time babies start to get some type of rhythm in. Um, and so you want to understand like what when baby's nursing, one breast, both breasts, um, how often, how long. Some people, yeah. baby, you know, all of those things become, people think I'm just trying to tell them nursing is so nuanced because yeah. I want to sure people protect their supply and just not start adding pumping, pumping, yeah. pumping. And then it does more than what they expect. And then that relationship can be impacted. Yeah. Oh my gosh. That's so much amazing information. And I know anyone who's listening is probably frantically taking notes and trying to digest it. Um, you know, with the, with the lactation counselors, and I know there's other certified lactation consultants, and there's a, a little bit of a difference in each. What, what does that look like in terms of cost and like a time commitment to work with someone? So it just, so the difference is anyone other than what's called an IVCLC, yeah. um, they have their own, they are more clinical. So anyone else, um, certain clinical concerns, when I, uh, I just help people, I tell people all the time, I have no desire to be an IVCLC. It's just not for me because I just want to um, when it becomes something clinical, then I want to refer you out to someone else that can actually study, understand the more of the, what's going on with the body and all that stuff. Um, so that's where people refer out when you are something else other than an IBCLC. I respect their designation. I respect yeah. what they do. It's just not for me because most people don't need all of that. Most people just, if they're pumping, they just need to learn how to use the product. Right. right. Something is going on, then they do need a referral and I happily have a referral network that I send them to. But as far as cost, it just depends on what everywhere you live. Um, yeah. you know, someone lives in Northern Virginia like me and someone lives in, you know, the cost of living is completely different. Um, it depends on their skill set. So I specialize in pumping. So I am one of the very few lactation private practices that sees people around the whole entire world only focused on pumping. So yeah. for that with and I have a lot of product. People think I get gifted a lot of my product. I owned at least 20 to 25 before I started Pumping Purpose. Wow. So, yeah. Um, I get gifted some things now, but I stay up to date on the pumping community. I will drop $600 to $1,000 on a pump if I want to make sure I have it in my arsenal when people pull up. So I know what it feels like. I know what they're talking about versus suction four on a one pump and a suction four on another pump totally. is completely yeah. 
And you have to be able to understand what someone is telling you when they're bringing those things up. So I spend a lot of money in my practice to make sure we have what people need. Like, I just want to show you like all of this. I know, I know. I'm seeing that in the back. I'm like, what is all that? I thought they were gift bags. Wow. It goes all the way down to the floor because I am committed to normalizing pumping and letting the world know that we pump with purpose. If I have to stand alone, I don't intend to be the easy way or the popular way, but people to know that I stand with them to make sure that they get the care that they deserve. Oh man, I love that. I could talk to you all day about pumping. So I've taken a bunch of notes, so much good information. For anyone listening, can you tell them where to find you, website, email, social, all the places? And I'm on, oh my gosh, I can't even keep up, nine social media platforms wow. now. I, I want to be wherever the pumping community is. I intend to own names. So if you're pumping, you're going to know the pump with purpose. I'm pump with purpose on all nine of the social media, Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, YouTube, Pinterest, LinkedIn, Amazon Live. All but, the places. Yes, but I'm in all the places. Instagram is my biggest. That's where I am. My largest audience is. I'm there each and every day. I go live twice a week on Tuesdays and Thursdays as of the, the day recording. Um, I'm in my stories each and every day. I have a weekly schedule that each week I talk about a new pumping topic. So even if people don't want to invest in services, I make sure that they at least understand the considerations that they should consider if they are pumping. Right. Um, when up. I love proactive care. Some people wait until something's really about to happen and go on. And sometimes I'm booked one, two weeks in advance. So I try to encourage people getting a plan together. Doesn't mean you have to have anything wrong. You just already have the plan. And my clients know exactly what to do when they face those concerns, right. but you can find me there. My website is www.pumpwithpurpose.com. Um, you can subscribe to my email list um, to get different updates from me. I do email marketing. Also, I give a link tree link guide to like tell them all about all the products that are on the market not that they need all of them but they can at least like see a cohesive list um but yes i just want to be wherever the pumping community is it is truly my passion turn purpose that i just want the world to know that they can do whatever that they're mind to oh my gosh i love that so much diana thank you so much for joining me today i really appreciate your time